So good afternoon. Welcome to panel 13. What future for security exceptions? We have two panelists here. The third one, Alexander, unfortunately, could not make it. And I will moderate the session. I'm Michelle Sanchez from FGV Sao Paulo, Brazil. The topic of this panel is highly tightly linked to the guiding title of the year conference International Economic Law and Geopolitical Confrontation in Geoeconomic Organization. And one of the first opening sessions yesterday on national security exceptions. So, what future for security exception is certainly one of the pressing questions that brought us here in this conference. And looking ahead is our challenge. We have two papers that I had the privilege to read and both raise important topics in this session. One from Caroline Hankins, Associate Professor at Monash University in Australia that draws on essential security interests in investment treaties security exceptions. The second contribution from Irina Bogdanova, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the World Trade Institute in Switzerland, is about the implications of the 5G technology politicization and securitization. Both authors depart from the scholarship on securitization of international economic relations and describes how countries are raising their logic of national security risk. The authors opt for analysis of cases and decisions. Carolyn on past jurisprudence of the ICJ and arbitrations on international investment agreements. And Irina on how a strategy to claim about restrictions imposed by certain countries with the prominence of the use of the WTO committees to claim about Australian measures in a more recent arbitration based on a BIT against Sweden after the recourse to, uh, without success to Swedish domestic courts. So on behalf of the dynamics, I propose three rounds of questions connecting the papers as an opportunity for the authors to describe the appropriate papers and explore further the connected topics looking ahead to the potential impact of those cases. After it, we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A session. My first and broader question is, what is national security about? So uh, based on the cases and the theoretical support, what are the real policy concerns when countries invoke national security exceptions? Carolina, so we have 80 minutes each to give us a picture of your theoretical support for those uh, positions. Thank you, Michelle. So um, by way of background, about 400 out of 3,000 investment treaties contain a security exception, and the new treaties are more likely to contain one than the earlier treaties. And unlike the GATT, most investment treaty security exceptions don't actually define what essential security is, which leaves it entirely up to tribunals to determine whether or not an issue is a security issue. So what I wanted to do is talk a bit about the concept of security in this first round, and then perhaps um, if time allows in the next round, I'll get into the cases. So as we know, the concept of security in international economic law has broadened beyond traditional security concerns uh, to include matters such as preserving and protecting domestic industries in the trade context. And as we've already heard in this conference, people are calling for issues like climate change and COVID-19 and other issues to come within security exceptions, which risks uh, in the investment context quite far reaching incursions into investor rights, if we want to call them rights. I actually say they're not rights, but that's a, a different paper. Now, traditionally the concept of security focused on international relations rather than domestic concerns and threats to security were understood to arise from other countries' military forces, um, threatening the territorial integrity of states. But during the 1980s, the security agenda was gradually broadened to encompass the concept of human security, which includes economic welfare, environmental problems, uh, even cultural identity, political rights, uh, social concerns and other social problems. And this expansion in the concept of security arose as a result of what security theorists term securitization, which is the transformation of otherwise ordinary aspects of governments into security issues, or in fact, the, 
the transmogrification of those issues. And this expansion in the concept of security arose as a result of a process of what is termed securitization. And now securitization or security theorists say that an issue becomes a security issue due to what is called, as you might know this from philosophy, a speech act. So when somebody designates a particular issue, a security issue, it becomes one. And so securitization succeeds when an actor or actors manage to convince their government that a particular issue is a security issue. And here the idea is when we utter the word security or when we're saying that something is a security threat, um, we're claiming that there is or should be the power to use whatever means are necessary to block it. And so claiming an issue to be a security issue is the result of a securitization process um, arising from the Speech Act rather than being based on objective criteria. And so here we see a range of issues being securitized that actually have nothing to do with our traditional understanding of security, um, but have been successfully securitized. And if we can securitize a particular issue, um, we're placing it on the political agenda, we make it a governmental priority, and we're actually attracting government funding to support our particular claim. But more importantly, for our purposes, if we're looking at investment law, once a particular issue becomes securitized, it is possible to demand and legitimize extraordinary governmental action um, that infringes on individual rights. And you can see that in the human rights context, for example. And so while it's no longer controversial to say that the concept of security should be brought up in those traditional military concerns, um, the, broadening of, the broadening of the concept has been controversial. Um, on one view, the effect of broadening the concept of security is that the distinction between security and other governmental policy issues is elided or perhaps even eviscerated. And so what this means is that the concept of security really risks being hollowed out completely. Um, security can end up encompassing the entire social and political agenda of governments. So that's kind of the background, but how does this relate to ISDS? Well, securitization in the context of investor state dispute settlement arises where a government is able to successfully persuade a tribunal that certain matters ought to fall within a security exception, um, which has the effect of shielding the state from liability and therefore the duty to pay compensation. So if we understand security broadly here, this risks states avoiding liability in relation to a broader range of circumstances that governments probably had anticipated uh, when they entered into the investment treaty with significant impacts on foreign investors. And if we look at, and I'm just skipping ahead, but I'll come back to this point. If we look at the cases against Argentina, we can see that it was successful in persuading actually all of the tribunals, even the earlier ones, that a severe economic crisis was a security issue, um, that its measures adopted in relation to its economic crisis were measures taken to deal with security concerns. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm actually, ag I'm undecided. I'm agnostic at this stage about how broad the concept of security should be. And I think I've pointed out some of the risks of a broad understanding, but there are also risks of a narrow understanding, which I hope to come back to. Um, if we look at the other cases, we see India arguing um, unsuccessfully that its actions to cancel agreements to lease capacity on telecommunications satellites taken for a range of different purposes uh, was also a, a question of security. Um, but going back to securitization and, and the ability of uh, relevant actors uh, to securitize issues and then to legitimize extreme or uh, far-reaching governmental measures. Um, because of the potential for government action taken in the name of security to be beyond the reach of full judicial scrutiny, and here I'm talking about so-called self-judging, uh, don't really like that terminology, but it's probably familiar to you, uh, where we have a security exception that only permits partial judicial scrutiny, or maybe even no judicial scrutiny at all, depending on the way in which the clause is drafted, um, the securitization of issues can arguably undermine the proper scrutiny of government action. So I will leave it there, but um, hopefully I've kind of set the scene for what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much, Gilman, uh, for the theoretical background that are kind of supporting these perspectives and um, 
also just define uh, the, the resource to national security exceptions. So I turned to Rina asking her about the novelties, for example, about the Hawaii case reveal on the notion of national security. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, my paper is very narrowly focused. It's talking mostly about securitization of 5G infrastructure, in particular rollout of 5G. And that's why at the beginning, I would like just, just to briefly mention what is, what, is, what is it, what is the economic implications, and what is the security risks. And then probably with, based on this, I will build up my case why this issue became so much securitized in the government policies and discussions globally. So talking about 5G, uh, in general terms, it's just next generation of the secular networks. But in fact, it's not only next generation because based on its capacity to transform almost every industry existing, and because it will be the technology, it will be underpinning digital transformation, it became something what some scholars call is a paradigm shift. So it will be completely new infrastructure, which because of its technical characteristics, which include uh, increased speed, reduced latency, and uh, greater bandwidth will offer completely new so-called use cases. So all these futuristic pictures of the future when we promise that our fridge will be able to send a signal to a local grocery store, which will uh, then deliver a bottle of milk to our house. In fact, all of this will be built on the 5G infrastructure because 5G infrastructure enables so-called machine to machine communication. So it enables something what is already has been labeled as internet of things. On top of other case uses, which is just enhanced communication, which will can kind of allow us to download videos almost in real time without any, any delay. And on top of this, um, all these innovative products like driverless cars and many other innovations, they will be based on this 5G infrastructure, which is in fact, just new generation of the infrastructure. Just it's completely different and because of its technological kind of coverage and technological solutions, which it offers, it will also include massive investment because it requires significant update of the existing infrastructure. So setting this kind of as a background, um, I would briefly also say a few things about security risks because um, there are significant security risks and at least there are three levels of risks. First, it's um, so-called excess level of risk it access to this 5G infrastructure. So governments, when they're responsible for the infrastructure, they should guarantee businesses and individuals access to this infrastructure. This is one certain category of risks. Second category of risk relates to infrastructure as such. And in particular, it's most significant, it's cyber, cyber attacks risks or cyber risks. And there are different types of risks. It includes not only uh, protection against cyber attacks, but it also includes, for example, protection against unauthorized access, so-called cyber espionage over commercial information, personal information. And third category of risks, the so-called service level of risks, it's security of commercial and personal information of the users who will exchange uh, their personal information, commercial information using these networks. So there are all levels of risks which requires certain government responses. And then also talking about the technical side of this 5G infrastructure, it should be mentioned that there have, there have been already discussion that most probably for the next years to come, it will be the last physical infrastructure installed. So it is expected that the, re, that the new updates that will come later will be only matter of software or replacing some smaller components. So, and that's why the, the rollout of this infrastructure became such a securitized Top, not only because of this, but this is kind of uh, so, so sort of based on the facts, this is pure risks which are there. They are not affiliated with any particular provider. And I should, it should be mentioned here that there are not that many companies that provide so-called end-to-end solutions to this 5G rollout. And two of the Chinese companies are <clears throat> one of the biggest providers is Huawei and the Yi. And there are three others providers which uh, exist globally. And um, so, so talking about uh, the issue of securitization of 5G, there are some sort of um, objective reality which requires certain government responses. And that's why it's not only political interpretation of that the, there are risks that come from Chinese companies, but also these facts on the grounds that require certain kind of actions. And also it's, it should be noted that from a technical standpoint, it's impossible to check the equipment which would be used in advance. So any new update to the existing infrastructure 
potentially allows the provider to install backdoors for all sorts of reasons. And we have seen it already, similar strategy we have seen, I don't know to what extent you're following, but there have been a big cyber attack, which was called solar winds, which is particularly was this so-called, it's very interesting how it's called in technical language, it's called supply chain attack. So hackers also use supply and chain language. So it's supply chain attack. Basically what the idea was behind the cyber attack is that they targeted not the network of the government because they are well protected, but they targeted their um, they targeted their software that was used by this network. So they installed backdoor in that software. And when there was a regular update, they in fact infiltrated the networks of the government and was fine on the US government for, I think for around nine months before it was detected. And it was actually detected by an accident of some sort of technician just looking at it and seeing some suspicious transfer of data. And so uh, with this, I will conclude my introduction. <sighs> Uh, the second point, I think that we see this enlargement of the parties and structures connected to the notion of national security. And this specific moment of the digital revolution that is having the shift. But the question here now is when we get legal action, right? So uh, the level of politicization and securitization are in the cases described as IT threats in your papers. So am I, my, my, a proposal to you is to elaborate a little bit more on the cases that you bring in your papers. For example, uh, in, in the case of Hawaii, can you get your perspective in why Hawaii was selected in claiming at the WTO level, at the level of the committees, and in taking exclusively the case of Sweden ahead? Um, okay, uh, before, before going into this question, I will briefly uh, just add one point about why we, why we have seen such a huge securitization of the 5G discussion. So in my previous uh, intervention, I have already outlined the technical side of the debate, but now we are entering this, this field of political discussion, particularly because when we are talking about allowing Chinese vendors to provide you components, which are essential for 5G rollout, you're talking about all sorts of questions which you have to these Chinese suppliers. In particular, there have been questions regarding their uh, ownership structure of Huawei company, its uh, affiliate, affiliation with the Chinese military. Uh, that is subject to the Chinese national security law, which also obliges it to cooperate with the government in certain cases. So that's second level of, uh, this is kind of second level of reasons why this discussion of 5G became so such a security topic and such a political discussion. And obviously the, the, the high level of this discussion is this kind of geopolitical competition between the United States and China for, for the technological superiority. So that's, that's how this whole discussion of 5G became very much securitized. Now, looking at the, what has been doing Huawei in order to offset this negative repercussions. So Huawei have been actually pursuing different strategies. And part of them are probably strategies of, which were coordinated with the government. Part of them were just normal company strategy. So Huawei, when there was different types of restrictions, Huawei tried to question these restrictions at domestic courts, as well as using international courts and all the available instruments. So at domestic level, uh, there were several restrictions, several restrictive measures introduced in the United States, and each of these measures was taken to court by Huawei. Looking at what Huawei was doing in Europe, for example, before going to investment arbitration, before initiating this case, Huawei tried to challenge at the Swedish domestic courts these restrictions against using Huawei. So Huawei, in, in a way, it went through first domestic legal systems, trying to, to gain some sort of uh, certain to gain some sort of uh, successful maybe cases. And then looking at how Huawei was trying to use international um, economic order, um, it was raising concerns regarding different types of restrictions introduced by countries such as Australia, for example, Belgium, as well as Sweden, at the different committee meetings at the WTO. In particular, there have been discussions at the uh, Committee on Market Access, uh, Council for Trading Goods and Council for Trading Services. Again, it has been happening already since 2018. And throughout 2022, there have been also discussions of different committees at the WTO. 
looking at the use of investment um, arbitration, uh, already in 2019, Huawei actually threatened Czech Republic to initiate a dispute. In fact, it didn't proceed with any dispute, but there was some threats and then it, it found its reflection in some sort of already, uh, even the discussion in the media of what might be potentially coming out, out of that uh, arbitration case. But then at, at the beginning of, in January 2022, where we initiated a dispute exit case uh, against Sweden based on uh, China-Sweden BAT, um, which was concluded in 1982 and uh, amended in 2004. And this is pending case. So as of now, there have been not, not much except um, I have heard <laughs> from a trusted source who is affiliated with the Swedish government that Sweden has a high hopes to dismiss this case on jurisdictional, jurisdictional grounds. They hope that they will not go into their substance because this uh, BAT doesn't have any national security or public policy exception. That's why, uh, and even amended version from 2004 doesn't have any exclusive national security. So. That's why they, they invest a lot of efforts into dismissing this case as early as it will be possible. And this is very interesting question about why Huawei pursues different strategies with respect to WTO investment case. And um, in my opinion, probably uh, in investment case, they still can gain some sort of, they have a fairly good chances is if they will go into the, uh, merits of the case, they have fairly good chances to get some sort of monitor compensation. And I think strategically thinking as a, from perspective that Huawei is still kind of company that still struggles to get some sort of income, despite that they were heavily heated by the US sanctions, which were introduced in 2019 and then reinforced in the later years. <clears throat> but they still try to, to operate as a more or less like a private company, I think about kind of gaining some sort of something out of out of dispute settlement, not just pure moral satisfaction. And uh, I think looking at the WTO, uh, they probably expect that any such case will end up being national security dispute and then are they peeled into the void or most probably just peeled into the void and they will waste money uh, on this case and waste time, but, but didn't get any kind of satisfaction, which you can monitor in terms of satisfaction. Um, I think um, this. Okay. And Carolina, I think that more specifically in this question, I, a great contribution in your paper is really this historical analysis of different cases, right? And uh, my question would be if you see political commonalities in this, the cases that you analyzed, what was the start for this legal action? And because we have different legal frameworks for the cases we analyze, uh, like treaties of friendship, uh, international investment agreements, and institutions, because we had an international court such, such as the ICJ and ad hoc arbitrations. Uh, did they play different roles in each historical period in similar cases? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, what I have done is look at not only how investment tribunals have uh, treated the concept of essential security interests, but also how the International Court of Justice has done so in relation to treaties of friendship, commerce and navigation, which you might know are the precursors to investment treaties signed by the US and many of which are still in force today. And we can actually see uh, perhaps some quite different approaches from the Court of Justice compared to investment tribunals. Um, the ICJ has looked at this issue three times in cases between the US and Iran. There's one case that's pending. Um, and in these cases, um, it hasn't to be, I suppose, just to kind of, there's a slight caveat, it hasn't really drilled into essential security interests, but it made a few remarks about what it <coughs> thinks this means, which will kind of shed light on the concept. So it's adopted a broad approach to the concept of uh, essential security interests that extends beyond traditional uh, approaches to security. It's actually said that it's going to apply a type of reasonableness test to determine whether or not a particular state of affairs engages security concerns. And in one case, it did appear to give the concept of security an economic dimension when it said that, um, when it talked about the importance of uninterrupted commerce in the Persian Gulf and said that that was a security uh, concern. 
Um, and judges and dissenting and separate opinions have said that it might not be the proper role of the court to actually undertake an inquiry as to whether or not a particular state of affairs engages security concerns. Um, and that states should be given a margin of discretion that designating a particular issue a security issue or securitizing a particular issue was really a political question that shouldn't be overridden unless the state's judgment was patently unreasonable. And then in the most recent case, the majority of the court took up those ideas that were in the dissenting and separate opinions in previous cases. Talked about this idea of a margin of discretion in identifying particular issues as security issues. Uh, although one of the judges said that the concept should be construed narrowly, that essential security relates to the existential core of state functions, such as protecting the state's territory from external threats and the maintenance of public order internally. So that's where the ICJ got to. Now, as you probably know, in the investment context, there are two sets of cases. Firstly, the Argentina cases, and secondly, the India cases. Now, in relation to the Argentina cases, I'm sure everyone knows all about them, so I won't go into much detail. There's been an absolute proliferation of literature on these cases, some good, so not so good, which still continues today. Um, but I did want to say a couple of things <laughs> about how tribunals interpreted the concept of essential security interests, which um, hasn't really been explored so much. Now, even though the early tribunals completely misunderstood the nature of a security exception, they all took the view, uh, they all did something that was arguably right. I, I am a, a bit equivocal on this, as I've already mentioned, but they all took a, an interpretation of the concept of security as encompassing economic emergencies, uh, particularly severe economic emergencies. But, and then the more recent decisions took the same approach. But something that I found quite interesting was that all of the tribunals, even uh, the more recent ones, um, emphasized the severity of the economic crisis. So they seem to be saying that only a severe economic crisis would engage security concerns and not something less than that. And obviously the situation in Argentina was quite dire. Now, if we look at how they did this, most of them looked at the concept of essential in relation to security interests. So here we can see essential, the concept of essential playing two different roles. So many economic and other issues could be characterized as engaging security concerns, but not be so grave as to be essential, to raise essential security interests with the concept of essential um, really serving as a threshold of seriousness of the relevant issue. And most tribunals take that approach. Now, the other approach uh, to the term essential, which is taken by um, arguably some of the judges on the ICJ and also on the India tribunals, is the centrality of the issue to the state's core aspects of government. So here we can say um, some functions are essential to governance and some are on the periphery. Uh, and so I can speak a bit more about that in a moment. But I think the breadth of the concept of security accepted by the Argentina tribunals um, suggests that a similarly broad approach would be adopted in relation to other areas of policy that also gave rise to quite uh, significant concerns on the part of the state. Um, even, uh, no, I've already made that point. So in the cases against India, we actually see quite a completely different story. So here we see this reversion to a more narrow understanding of the concept of security. Um, these cases aren't so well known, but as I mentioned, it resulted they resulted from India's decision to cancel some contracts for leasing parts of the telecommunication spectrum. Um, India did this for a couple of reasons. The military was concerned that private use of the spectrum would hinder its defense activities, but also India wanted to reserve parts of the spectrum for a number of other things such as uh, transportation, uh, uh, online education, uh, telehealth, and things like that. Um, both tribunals said that the allocation of the spectrum for defence purposes was a security question, which is completely uncontroversial. But uh, somewhat more controversially, uh, the, the tribunals both said that a measure of deference was owed to states, and this is kind of echoing what we're seeing a lot in investment treaty arbitration. Uh, they talk about deference and then they do something completely differently. Um, these tribunals then said that the concept of security shouldn't be stretched beyond its natural meaning. And I had some sympathy for that view. Uh, and here both tribunals did seem to take the approach, and here I don't agree with them, 
that security actually was limited to military or defense matters. Now, um, as Ben Heath has written about, and I encourage you to read, I think he has three papers now about security. Um, really the Indian tribunals could have said it was all about security or they could have kind of diced it up in a slightly different way. Um, and these tribunals also expressed some views about the concept of essential. One of them said essential related to the, the seriousness of the security concern and the other tribunal said that essential related to the, um, to the core or essence of state security, which goes back to the idea that essential relates to the centrality of the issue for governance. Um, and both tribunals emphasized the distinction between security interests and other public interests. So here we see this real resistance to this kind of broader securitization of different issues. So I suppose, um, do I have another couple of minutes or is my yeah. time up? Well, I suppose the concept of essential security interests not being defined in most of these treaties really creates dilemmas for tribunals who have to determine whether or not a particular issue is a security issue, for states who don't know whether or not they're gonna be able to successfully defend these claims, but also for investors who can't have any confidence that their recourse to arbitration will be successful. So on the one hand, you could say that a broad interpretation of security um, can achieve an appropriate balance between protecting foreign investment and host state regulatory autonomy or ensuring governments have the capacity to respond to genuine security concerns um, and making states liable in cases where security is a contested concept, perhaps uh, causes or contributes to concerns about um, the regime's legitimacy. Um, on the other hand, um, a broad approach to security really raises or provides a huge range of reasons for non-compliance with treaties. And the concept really, as I indicated before, can become meaningless um, and allow states to escape liability uh, in relation to a very broad range of measures. So on the other hand, the other argument is that extending the concept beyond the traditional view of security um, risks upsetting the balance again, between public and private interests, between investor and state uh, interests. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's the argument. Um, so, and Ben has also made this point very well. So we have this situation here where tribunals are grappling with um, an expanded concept of security and they have to determine whether novel claims made in the name of security are really security concerns. They also, and I don't think this has happened in the investment context yet, uh, it may arise in a couple of cases that are pending, that if I have time, I'll talk about. But uh, there's also the issue of uh, distinguishing between uh, genuine security concerns and security just being used as an argument, uh, really a pretextual argument for other things that states are trying to do. Unlike general exceptions, security exceptions typically have no chapeau. So there's no arbitrary and unjustifiable discrimination between we, we don't see that at all. So um, these, these provisions can really, I suppose, uh, open the door to abuse and we see that in the trade law context. Um, I've got a few ideas about how we can deal with this situation, but I feel like I should probably pass the mic <laughs> yeah. back to the chair and I can maybe talk about that in the next round. round. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great. And this is also a uh, nice round. It's also like pushing a little bit beyond your papers for the sake of our debate here. And having in mind um, what we have uh, discussed yesterday uh, that was provoked in the round table by Catherine Claus, more precisely, and during the panel two discussion that, were, that I have attended with Ben Heath, I think beyond the current system and its rational. So if not a legalist approach, what alternatives? You went up papers, both papers with a skeptical perspective on international law and economic law curing capacity, either by trade or by investment treaties to take the discretionary claims for national security by states. So in the case of India, we can see that developments after 2016 show that countries are still adjusting the national security clause in international investment agreements in order to include in larger perspectives such as greater infrastructure and still to force self-judging approaches to the interpretation of the clause. My question then would be, based on your research, what would be your suggestions for future development on emergencies, de-risking de rules and safeguards clauses? 
So can you start by giving them a key? Um, I will start briefly outlining government policies, which have been happening just globally with respect to involvement of Chinese companies in the 5G rollout. And then I will jump into what are, what are the problem behind this and whether international economic law can resolve this problem through national security or not. So looking at the government, um, a different types of government responses, I basically, after analyzing the whole number of countries, what they're doing domestically, um, I categorize them in three diff different categories. First, it's explicit bans. A number of countries explicitly ban Chinese companies. Most, well, again, when we talk about 5G, we're talking about basically two companies that have enough standard essential patents and then have enough kind of capacity to, to provide this kind of infrastructure. It's Huawei and to a less extent the team. So mostly we are talking about anti-Huawei bans. And when we are talking about countries and introduce explicit bans, um, very explicit were countries which belong to so-called 5i intelligence sharing uh, organization. So th this were the companies that this was a country, sorry, that explicitly banned Huawei. And the first country which did it, it was actually Australia, then followed up by the United States. And uh, United Kingdom had a little bit interesting perspective with respect to participation of Huawei in its 5G infrastructure. Initially, before 2020, the country allowed certain Huawei components to be used in the so-called non-core elements of the infrastructure. But in fact, when we are talking about 5G, there is not that much distinction between core and non-core elements of the infrastructure. This is one of the peculiarity of 5G as a new generation of uh, telecommunication networks. So, and, and then after Huawei was sanctioned by the United States and after United States also put some pressure on the UK in, in 2020, they actually reversed the course and they announced that uh, all the installed infrastructure should be removed before 2027. So the next approach is so-called, what I call risk-based approach. It's followed by the United, uh, by the uh, European Union. And it, it's kind of formally risk-based approach by a number of documents at the EU level. Uh, there was introduced such a concept that of high-risk vendor. In fact, starting from 2019, there have been several documents released which talk about so-called non-technical risks which can, which can impact the rollout of 5G. In particular, uh, it was the idea that every country should review suppliers, vendors, not only from technical perspective, but also from non-technical perspective, in particular to analyze if the supplier can be subject of so-called third-party intervention. In fact, I, I mean, it's a very delicate way to say we don't want to see who way in our telecommunications infrastructure, but it, it's it's very delicate way without naming the country, just to say there are a group of high-risk vendors we just could not allow to use their components in our infrastructure. And in fact, th there have been a toolkit developed. Um, with respect to the European Union, one big question which should be addressed here is that uh, the question of competence. It's not uh, the question of, of 5G security of the 5G infrastructure. It's not the question which uh, belongs to the member states per se, and it's not the question that is given to the union as such and its uh, bodies. So it's kind of a borderline question. And that's why um, at the European Union, they release different kind of policies and they introduce this 5G security toolbox and they encourage countries to, to introduce domestic measures. And they even have been introducing this kind of reports. So the, the latest report on the introduction of this kind of uh, risk evaluation methodologies have been released in June this year. So, and there have been again, number of countries which were not named but which we just mentioned that there is a, this number of countries at the EU level who didn't introduce these measures, who do not have domestic frameworks to look at the suppliers of their 5G. Um, and in fact, one of the consultancy companies that does very, very good job in analyzing kind of uh, what components are used um, at each EU market in this recent reports, again, released just a couple of months ago, said that in fact, even after 2020, number of countries uh, have been buying Chinese equipment for 5G rollout, which again raises this tension. And at the EU level, I don't know how much you're following debate, there have been always reports that Germany should kind of step up the game and should introduce um, different types of frustrations against Huawei because Germany, Italy, and a number of other countries, they still have big 
percentage uh, of Chinese components in their infrastructure. So, and the last group of countries, the countries that didn't introduce any restrictions. So, and uh, I would like to point out two of them, South Korea and Switzerland. So South Korea, in fact, it has been already in a very complicated situation politically because its main security partner is the United States, its main trading partner is China. So, and in order to navigate this situation, they're very cautious with introducing any restrictions, although they're pushed by the US under the threat that they will not share certain intelligence information, something. At the same time, they're very cautious, not because China already said that, as always, China always says in very delicate language, but that the retaliation will follow. And uh, and the and Switzerland again, there was a discussion in Parliament, in Swiss Parliament, under the request of a group of uh, uh, members of Parliament about uh, whether the country should restrict or not restrict go away from its 5G uh, telecommunication networks. And basically, uh, the government, I mean, there was a discussion which resulted in a conclusion that one way or another, we could not provide solutions which will be Swiss-based, so we will be dependent on some external suppliers. And because we do not have capacity to develop such a complex solutions, and there is not 100% proved information that China engages in, in China's way, we engages in cyber, cyber espionage. So basically we will allow our companies to decide for themselves, but following, but also following kind of cybersecurity laws which are inside of the country. So that was the outcome of that discussion. And now turning towards the question of um, another issue which I would like to address in the context of 5G securitization is this uh, notion which starts gaining traction in international relations literature is so-called weaponized interdependence. And in fact, we have already heard today uh, during sanctions panel when there was a discussion of financial sanctions. And in particular, when we're talking about weaponized interdependence, there have been discussion of this concept in, with respect to SWIFT messaging system and with respect to so-called policy of the United States to weaponize its currency, so-called, I mean, sometimes it's called dollar unilateralization. But basically, the United States using its exclusive power and its market power introduces different types of sanctions, which are basically become binding even third countries and third country nationals and third country entities, for example, sanctions against Iran. And, uh, and there have been criminal cases brought against people who violated these sanctions. And there have been people who are serving uh, sentences in the US who are foreign nationals who have never been, uh, I don't know, who have no residence right in the US who were just punished by transferring, by facilitating certain kind of financial transaction, which involved in certain, uh, in certain way, uh, Iranian companies. So, and then in the context of uh, Russian war against Ukraine, um, for the European Union, the topic of um, interdependence becomes very sensitive because, again, Russia has made an attempt to weaponize energy supplies. And that's why nowadays this kind of uh, idea of relying on the infrastructure which will be built by a potential political rival who can then kind of not provide you with necessary components to replace certain parts or with, will not provide you with a necessary update that will allow this infrastructure to run properly or can potentially install back doors and allow spying or stealing commercial information, personal information of uh, individuals and so on. It became very sensitive. And, and that's why this issue is already raised to, to certain kind of, that's why I'm talking about securitization of polit or politization of this 5G rollout, because this issue has become so securitized that in fact, even the existence of certain, of certain norms uh, under WTO law or investment agreements, it, it doesn't constrain states from introducing policies which they consider to be beneficial for their national security. And in this situation, I think it's very hard to talk about some sort of interpretive, uh, new interpretation of national security or new, new formulation of national security, which can kind of prevent, or which can function as a constraint against states introducing their own decisions with respect to whether to allow certain Chinese components in the infrastructure or not to allow this. And one of the, potential probably solution will be is some sort of effort to build a trust because in fact it became now this kind of supply like use of Chinese components became a trust issue but at the same time like looking at the technical possibility of a, for example combining certain components from one supplier with the Chinese uh, uh, supplies in the 5G it became not feasible because usually at least from 
what my research shows that when we're talking about telecommunication companies making decisions what components to use, they prefer to use the same components throughout the whole network. So it doesn't make sense for them commercially to diversify supplies. So if they agree, for example, that it will be Ericsson who will install this kind of end-to-end -end solution, then it will be this company. If they decided that it will be Huawei because Huawei actually usually provides much cheaper prices, which makes it very attractive for developing countries as a as a provider of this infrastructure. So again, potentially, like from a technical perspective, building trust doesn't seem very plausible. Uh, looking at geopolitical context, I think it's less even less plausible as a solution. So honestly, I do not see how to avoid this asymmetrical uh, situation of when you you allow certain company entrance into your telecommunication networks and then how, how can you constrain them from using it as an instrument of, of coercion or pressure or forcing your governments to not to pursue certain policies or to pursue certain policies how to avoid the situation of weaponized interdependence so I, I don't see any any clear solutions at least as of now. Okay, so how I can bring us to a very pessimistic position, but then I, <laughs> as maybe Carolyn has some uh, highlights on her findings. Thanks. So I think, and this might be slightly controversial, that we shouldn't be talking about security exceptions at all here. Mm -hmm. um, including exceptions in treaties arguably creates a range of problems. And I've talked about this a bit before, but I'm just going to talk about one of them. Most significantly here, it suggests that the appropriate place for considering the host state's motivations for its actions and the tailoring of its measure should happen only where a prima facie breach has been found, if we follow the WTO approach to interpreting exceptions. Um, so it suggests that the appropriate place for considering the state's objective is only in the context of the exception. But state's conduct should, I think, be uh, examined in the context of the primary norms, such as fair and equitable treatment. So here, this is the idea that if the state has acted for bona fide regulatory reasons directed toward public welfare, it shouldn't be liable in the first place, or even prima facie liable, which has a range of normative implications, which I don't think I have time to get into. So I think Sweden shouldn't be worried in relation to Huawei. Um, if it's done the right thing and it's got a genuine reason for the actions it's taken, it shouldn't, it shouldn't worry about going to the merits. Um, and so rather than, and then if we think about this in terms of treaty design, so rather than putting exceptions in treaties, and if we look at recent treaties, they have so many exceptions, the whole thing, if you look at the CPTPP, for example, it kind of doesn't even make sense. It's got so many exceptions, carve-outs, reservations, side letters, it's <laughs> complete mess. So we should focus on clarifying the regime's primary norms. So if we look at how the EU has done in its recent investment treaties in relation to fair and equitable treatment, um, we can see that uh, if we look at CETA, for example, if you have a genuine reason for your actions and you're taking just sort of ordinary regulatory measures, you won't be liable in the first place because your actions won't be manifestly arbitrary. And that's the test for regulatory measures. Now, some people arguable, argue that the security exception provides, provides an important fail-safe or safeguard for if the tribunal gets the obligations wrong. Um, so a security exception, general exception, should be in there as well. But I'm not sure I agree with that. And I'm working on a book at the moment that looks at this issue, among other things. Um, and then there's some other arguments that people have made. So rather than leaving it up to tribunals, maybe it would be better for security exceptions to list the types of interests that are covered. But I think this risks um, ossifying the exception. Uh, it'll fail to keep pace with evolving understandings of security, because I think security is just a concept that continues to evolve. Um, there's also this argument, and I don't think I agree with this one either, that states could do things like putting in carve-outs for climate change and other issues to basically exempt these types of measures from the scope of the treaty obligations themselves. Now, I think exceptions should be interpreted in the same way as carve-outs, although probably most people don't agree with me. Um, if you're interested in carve-outs for climate change, I would read a paper by Josh Payne and Liz Sheergold that just came out in GEAL, which is a very interesting piece. So I suppose 
if we go back to the case law, it doesn't really offer any real guidance as to when a situation is going to be held to um, be a security concern. And I guess this is not a particularly helpful observation because if you look at the body of decided investment cases, and I'm not going to call it case law because I don't think it's a legal system, um, it's not a very helpful observation because the case, the decided cases, the case law is contradictory mess in relation to all areas. And in any case, um, investment tribunals have only grappled with two uh, discrete fact situations. We don't have a range of cases where a range of different security concerns have been implicated. There's one final point I wanna make, and that's because that's the point that even if tribunals do take a broad approach to the concept of security, this doesn't necessarily mean that all measures will be justified because uh, I think I've looked at these, the majority of investment treaties containing a security exception also contain a necessary test. We all know what that means. Um, if we follow um, GATT case law, it can, can actually be quite rigorous. And in that sense, maybe it can discipline these quite adventurous invocations of security. Um, however, out of the 400 investment treaties containing a security exception, 150 of them contain a clause that is wholly or partly self-judging. And most of these treaties were concluded after the very problematic CMS in Argentina decision. Um, some are like GATT Article 21, in fact, most of them are, which does permit some objective review depending on which WTO you panel, panel you follow, what the applicable test might be. Um, but others appear to make the exception entirely self-judging, which is a development um, that we haven't seen in the cases yet. Uh, you might not know that there are two cases pending in relation to so-called self-judging uh, security exceptions, one that's based on GATT Article 21, so perhaps less interesting. Um, but another one that seems to be completely self-judging, it says, there's a footnote to the clause that says, for greater certainty, if a party invokes the exception in an arbitral proceeding, the tribunal find, hearing the matter shall find that the exception applies. So, okay, now that seems pretty clear cut, right? However, um, if you look at this case, and if you read the transcript of the hearing, which obviously I have no life because I spend my time pouring through these transcripts, um, the tribunal hearing that case seems to be indicating that it's not necessarily going to treat it as such, which is a very interesting development. So watch this space. That's all I'd like to say in relation to that. So thank you so much for the time. I was highlighting in a few minutes the main takes of their papers. We now have a lot on the table, so I will open for the first round of questions. I will collect about three for the first round. And I ask you please to identify yourselves by name and institution. So two here and then I'm in front. Yes, I am Daniel Frankie from the University of Sheffield. I found your presentation very interesting and also the callbacks to the conversation we had in Sanchez earlier this morning. So a question for both, just be quick. Caroline, I want to ask you whether you think that the current sanctions, for example, against Russia, we were having this conversation earlier, would still, in your opinion, be decided at the primary level. So uh, if, if you could fit that in that model, and, and if you think that is the case in the follow-up is, how would we just shift the problem from the exception to the carve out within the primary rules? Uh, Irina, uh, I found your uh, you know, your concept of work management at the time is very interesting, and I want your take on whether you think that these current uh, developments with Huawei, but also seen that with Russia, is a reversal of, I'm not sure whether it's called the numerical Mer doctrine, but it was this idea that the moment you entangle um, states like Russia in a web of obligations, all of a sudden you have reduced the risk of this becoming a broke state. We've seen that backfiring. Do you think that this is what's happening with China now and what comes next is a reversal of this trend or not? Thank you. Hello, I'm Patrick Arle from the University of Passau in Germany. And um, thank you, first of all, for all the wonderful presentations. It's very interesting. I have a question for Caroline. Following up on the, um, your, your last uh, statement, and I'm wondering, um, <laughs> Is it meaningful or does it make a difference uh, to make the distinction between the procedural and the substantive mechanism of 
well, let's say the security calls for better self judgment, judging uh, Mac, um, way of interpreting uh, national security, essential security. Uh, because I'm wondering uh, if we take the procedural avenue, if we run into problems that are related uh, to broader or damaging even broader um, <laughs> principles like the rule of law or the functions of uh, adjudication, judicial discipline, and discipline supplements in a way that it would be inappropriate for, for tribunal to shy away from saying something about a legal test just for procedural reasons. That is not even anchored in the substantive clause that the tribunal should interpret. Yeah. So, hiding the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Natalia, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentations. They were very interesting. I have one question for Caroline and one for Irene. Uh, my question to Caroline is related to, to your question, actually. Uh, I was wondering whether uh, if you think that uh, the other domain, the other dimension of a broadening, broadening concept of national security uh, is there really connected to the rule of law. Because uh, as you mentioned, uh, the securitization studies uh, demonstrate that national security is a speech act to justify exceptional measures. Uh, and then you, you said that we should look at uh, primary norms, but don't you think that national security displays for, uh, primary norms? And we are uh, we're, we're looking uh, in particular in investment screening mechanism right now at FDB, and uh, we are, uh, our, our uh, initial conclusions about this investment screening mechanism is that they uh, lack a lot of transparency and rule of law guarantees. So more in this sense. And uh, also connected to this, my, my question to Irene is that, uh, I don't know if this is within the scope of your of your article, but I was wondering if this um, explicit ban or this, even the risk-based approach uh, that ultimately bans Huawei uh, on the houses that you mentioned, they, uh, in, in a sense, they also violate the rule of law inside the country uh, adopting this kind of ban, if, if, if they adopted bans uh, following like a different uh, type of decision making process within the country. We we still have two other. I would suggest so we will brief first and then we have a second round. It's fine. So up to you. And you want to start? Okay, yeah. sure. So uh, thank you for those questions. Um, I must admit, I am not an expert on sanctions against Russia. Um, the question is, um, if we decide um, these sorts of cases at the level of primary norms, is this shifting the problem to the primary norm? So if we look at it in terms of fair and equitable treatment and the kind of recognised elements of fair and equitable treatment, we have discrimination, so we may have an issue there. Uh, we have uh, regulatory stability, not at issue here. We have legitimate expectations, I don't think relevant in this context. And we have transparency, which is a contested element. Um, so maybe we have a discrimination problem. Um, it's interesting that in the context of investment law, tribunals look at the state's reasons for its actions in a discrimination case in the context of the primary norm themselves and not the exceptions, unlike the GATT. So maybe there is scope for some kind of justification within the concept, within the context of the primary norm. Uh, the question about self-judging um, exceptions is an interesting one. So um, there are not that many, and I, I'm not sure if I'm gonna answer your question adequately, but there are not that many treaties yet that are so-called wholly self-judging. Um, and there are really two, I think, types. One is that kind of footnote that says the tribunal shall find that the exception applies. And the other one is uh, the, the, uh, the invocation of a security exception is non-justiciable, whatever that means. Um, and I think India's model treaty has a self-judging security exception, but it, so far it hasn't been particularly successful in persuading its partners to adopt that sort of thing. Although we, I think there's maybe three or four treaties. Um, should a tribunal interpret a self-judging uh, provision? Um, what I found interesting about this case that I just briefly indicated was um, the, the treaty says, 
where the security exception is invoked, the tribunal shall find the exception applies. Now, what this tribunal, what one of the members of the tribunal said is it's, he said, and I'm, I think I'm pretty much quoting here. He said, it says in this clause that the tribunal shall make a finding. So we are going to make a finding, whatever. And so he's really opening it up there for some kind of review, which I find fascinating. Now, I'm not sure I answered the question. Now, um, security and the rule of law and primary norms. Does national security displace the primary norms? Should it displace the primary norms? Well, I think as soon as you have actors waving the flag of security for pretty much anything, um, as Ben put it, the exception swallows the rule. And I think we have a, we have a really significant problem. Um, I'm not sure where I stand in relation to this. I, I'm still thinking about it, um, as is everybody here. Um, what I do think, though, is that the ICJ seems to be on the right track. Um, investment decisions are a bit of a mess. The ICJ is saying um, it's a reasonableness test. We're going to give states a margin of discretion, which means a margin of appreciation, deference. Um, and really, uh, at least on the face of it, um, designating an issue of security is primarily a political question and courts should be hesitant to intervene unless the ICJ said that um, designation is patently unreasonable. So I think national security should not displace the primary norms. There should be some scope for adjudicative review, but um, a limited scope affording um, quite a significant measure of deference. And I don't think I've got time to look at investment screens. I want to pass to you, Irina, before I hog the microphone for the rest of the session. So sorry about that. Okay. So first I will answer the question about weaponized interdependence and this idea. What, what you described is, I think in German speaking world is called von der So this is this idea that if we integrate non-democratic autocratic states into the whole set of international kind of relationship, including international economic relationship, and build these bilateral dependencies, economic dependencies, then we will avoid military conflict wars and everything, because there is this kind of political kind of political science doctrine, which kind of countries which depend on each other in economic terms don't go into the wars. So this, there's a significant number of literature discussing this idea, mostly political scientists. And um, I think they're a bit, a bit distinct to these ideas. First, this idea about uh, that we should integrate different countries in the same framework and create these economic dependencies. It's more about creating dependencies, right? Creating interdependencies and in such ways secure our future without kind of military conflicts and significant tensions because then it will be not beneficial to anyone to kind of go, go into the war with your main trading partner. But, but, but then again, there have been new additions. For example, there have been couple of years ago, there have been a new political scientists made a new kind of concept, they updated it, they said, well, this theory works only if there is no huge asymmetrical power. And it was, it was funny because it happened exactly when, when the Russia made first attempt to take some parts of Ukraine. So, and then Russia started introducing also different types of restrictions. So they saw that their concept, actually this idea framework doesn't work, so they started updating it. And when I talk about weaponized interdependence, and in particular, I'm looking at them, several articles which date back to 2019. I'm talking about in particular, not, not positive reflection of interdependence, not something that we get positive out of economic interdependence. It's something kind of negative that we get. So we have situations of asymmetrical kind of interdependence where one country or a group of countries are in a position to dictate to other countries, groups of countries, legal entities, individuals, who know, and whatnot, their position just because of the, they have this power, just because they, they have these instruments. And, and again, quite often in literature, they look at this uh, uh, financial, financial markets, how they work, about swift messaging system, but then in the context, recent events, again, it was um, energy interdependence. And then recently, the most recent developments is what is happening with the, uh, with the US efforts to prevent China from being self-sufficient in cutting edge semiconductors. They have been, and the semiconductor industry is very monopolized. And in fact, the cutting edge technology is basically in the hands of a number of companies that are based in, not in China. And 
So um, in all this kind of what we call these days cheap war, it's also one of the reflections of this weaponized interdependence in one way or another, because we have these asymmetries. So I, I would separate them because this idea of uh, kind of let's integrate other countries, it was more like a positive idea, like if you describe it, it was more like a idealistic concept that if we integrate a big number of countries, we will have some sort of beneficial economic relations and we will avoid some sort of uh, negative situations like military conflicts. But weaponized interdependence, it already kind of implies that there is some sort of asymmetry, which might be abused at, at any point in time, which creates the situation of potential gives the right to, to abuse this weaponized interdependence. And then um, going back to the question of the rule of law and whether the countries which exclusively ban or which introduce this kind of a very delicate frameworks, which tech, well, on the surface kind of um, origin neutral, but in fact, if you look how they apply, they kind of discriminate certain kinds of suppliers from entering the market or providing um, components for the 5G infrastructure. So they're usually, well, depending on the country, they're usually introduced by certain type of regulatory measures. So they're not completely baseless. So they are based on some sort of legal framework depending on the country and they have some sort of legal shape. Um, the fact that they violate um, international uh, obligations of these countries might, might have um, implications for the rule of law, depending on how broad you interpret the rule of law, because the rule of law is a very broad concept, probably one of the broadest in, in law in general. So, uh, but, but the fact that countries, they do some sort of a balancing exercise, they review the risks, they analyze this risk, and then they see whether they are willing to sacrifice part of the international commitments uh, in order to secure something, maybe what is more significant concern for them, the stability of their economic system, the digital infrastructure, then potentially the risks of cyber attacks and, and all other considerations which we're trying to outline. So it, again, it's a question which you can say yes or no at the same time. So shall we go for Second round, but we had already Lockhart and the and the And the first question is from Jane Fisher. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, so much. Uh, also, in your intervention, by uh, um, the session is very useful because it allows us also to take a step back and uh, look at uh, this a bit more holistically. And, the ultimate purpose uh, behind um, apparently is the, the footnote model you know, is um, I, I would consider that a gorgeous you know, <laughs> uh, idea if it wasn't serious and something that is enacted that is law in the books in the national treaties obviously states are entitled to make law the way they want uh, national legislators are at least bound by a constitution but the national legislators, they're bound on by the programs. And so this can be done, but that is completely nonsensical. You know, I, I think this this defies the the, the, the honor of the, of the legal system to, to do something like that. To say then then this is the law just because somebody thinks it is applicable. But anyway, um be that uh, as it may. Um, so that's certainly not, not a, a model with, with any future, but one has to think about these exceptions is what they, they do. They um, free the, the state in question from all the obligations to which the exception applies. And in most treaties, these are generally applicable exceptions. They apply to every obligation under the uh, treaty. That's why this has to be taken seriously and, and obviously has to be. Um, so then the narrow and um, now completely you know you had spoken about 5G, but um, I wanted to hear from you and so I will now ask you uh, to tell us about the financial justifiability of the 5G restrictions or uh, Huawei, whatever they want to call them. And I think that one can think only about three uh, possible avenues. One is Article 20 G. And you know to say that anything must be safe and there are back doors and so on, and that is prohibited. And that at first sight looks like a horizontal 
among the screen period and oscillation, the training will be training force, and the behavior of the are symmetrically correct from, from certain good countries. But I think the problem with that um, is there will be a de facto discrimination already in this legislation. So when the EG um, receives the challenges, then you have 21, which probably everybody was thinking about all the time, but without going completely into it. So please do that for us. Um, this can only be uh, two, uh, based on the argument that a mobile network will also be used by the military. Um, but it's not uh, standing up. And I don't even know how many experts in the research. So does the military actually use the model mobile network? Well, we know in the current world that this is actually sometimes true, and that can be also not how designed. But they normally have their own communication systems because they want to make. So how far can we get there? And and then there is the guts uh, public order uh, exception which does not exist in the, in, in the gut. And is that really made uh, for that, or are we ultimately not speaking about um, a market access uh, limitation where a country has first made the commitment by open up? Um, and yeah, there are exceptions, of course, that are part of the obligations, but if they don't apply, well, then you are going back on your uh, commitments, and that is then a different um, So please tell us what you think about it. And then Caroline, too, if you want to do, because everything you said about it, it is also fascinating. Uh, so, hi, I'm, I'm Theo from actually Sao Paulo, Brazil, also. Uh, so perhaps my question is a follow up from, from the authors. Uh, uh, perhaps I'd like to challenge one of the a premise in this debate for actually a premise of your presentation, Irina. Actually, I don't know if a premise of your presentation is a premise of this uh, of this debate, which is uh, why shouldn't we treat 5G as a traditional security uh, exception, a traditional security concern? I mean, why is 5G a, a should why 5G should be treated as an occasion to to rethink the, the, the concept of security? Because my, my my sense sometimes uh, is that the, the debate of 5G has emerged together with I don't know, climate change or economic crisis or the pandemic and it has been entangled in these new challenges. But uh, uh, following up on what Lothar said, uh, I don't know if actually the military may or might not use 5G, but if you have some reasonable ground to believe that uh, uh, 5G could, could have some kind of defense of military uh, use, uh, uh, why, sh why should it be desirable to constrain uh, state of discretion uh, to uh, impose some kind of restriction on uh, the provision of the infrastructure. I mean, I'm not advocating here for any kind of uh, restriction on individual rights uh, in the internet, but when it comes to the provision of a public service or to the provision of infrastructure, or, uh, why shouldn't it be some kind of, uh, 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 why shouldn't it be, why shouldn't there be state discretion here on this particular topic? Um, just, just taking on that, I mean, I, I kind of, Say it with certainty, but um, I, I used to serve. So I, what I can tell you is that uh, they actually is probably not useful for communications, but for intelligence, definitely. And that's one of the main branches of any military to collect information that no one else has doing. Really. So if that fits in national security, but my question is actually the other way around. I'm fascinated by uh, by, by your your idea, Carolyn, that that. We don't need this. Uh, we should we should go to the to the primary concept. But the reality is that I kind of agree with you that we don't really need them, but we have them, and it's going to be a little bit difficult to get away with them uh, with the ones we have. And you mentioned cases that are pending, the yeah, case that we decided, and it's also a concept that is also being used at, at, at the training. So with this, this um, states have this uh, power. To decide, or to, at least to say, I'm using this for security purposes. So my, my reverse question to you would be, what is clear cut not security for you today? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our last question, Gilmer. 
Yes, we have a question from Abdullah Bora. He is in the same session. So, Abdullah, you can speak now. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, it's Abdullah Bora from Turkey. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, actually my question is based on the, uh, the earlier uh, sessions of today, which was about the sanctions. It has been uh, mentioned that uh, the collective, collective self-defense measures could be you know, uh, classified as essential security interest under the article uh, 21 of GATT. Uh, do you think that the third party countermeasures are also could, you know, classified as a, you know, essential security interest, uh, especially when you think that these are, you know, uh, just given response to the, uh, like, you know, just like the uh, use of force, like uh, breach of obligations erga omnes. And just like that, like, it has been mentioned that the uh, human rights violations could not be uh, mentioned or qualified as a, uh, you know, essential security interest, but there are also obligations erga omnes. And do you think that they could also be uh, qualified uh, as such? Thank you. Okay, we have two minutes left. So I suggest if you could stay to three minutes. <laughs> so, let me start this um, Yeah, I will start by answering the question of uh, Lothar. Um, about WTO justiciability of, um, of certain restrictions in, in the context of 5G rollout. Um, I think the most natural kind of uh, way how countries might try to justify it, it will be by, by the invocation of the national security exception. Um, I'm not sure that it will be possible to justify it um, as, as related to uh, only to military use cases because in fact, this infrastructure will have much more use in non-military use cases. And that's why kind of, uh, and when we are talking, looking at the whole infrastructure and the restriction, then it obviously will be very hard to say that it's only made for the military purposes. Obviously it's made like for general, for general purposes. And if we look at the type of restrictions, which is for example, complete, complete ban on certain kind of companies to provide uh, components for the infrastructure. So when we look at the national security exception, how it will, how this interpretation was developed by the by the panels, uh, obviously the the biggest obstacle in this case will be this uh, objective element of the national security of, of the WTO national security exception, which is said measures should be taken in time time of war or other emergency in international relations, and since it works like an objective criteria. So it, it will be hard to, to argue that the new infrastructure can be, can be qualified at least as a other emergency in international relations. I, I, I think it's will, it will be uh, quite a stretch to, to try to argue this, at least on, based on the previous case law where they have been already elaborating what types of measures, what types of situations can qualify as emergency in international relations. So, and so I, I don't think that there are any, any good um, justifications and, um, for this type of measures again. And then um, addressing your question. Um, so you were talking about, so um, you were talking that why 5G became a national security issue, why we are even talking about this. And, and then you referred that wh why there shouldn't be granted discretion to, to states to uh, to deal with this issue the way they see is fits their national uh, national security objectives of their or their national goals. Um, in fact, it can be done like this, but, but then there should be some sort of an agreement, maybe, or some sort of kind of um, yeah, probably agreement between the countries that these issues are not covered by our existing obligations, and that's why we're kind of carving out this this particular um, type of, of situation with respect to uh, our international obligations under international economic law, because then it, it kind of puts uh, countries in different, in, in different boxes. Some countries just um, maybe concerned about violation, violating their WTO commitments or obligations under uh, international investment agreements and try to constrain themselves. 
and other countries are just um, decided they you know free to go the way they see so so if th then there should be some sort of an agreement that okay if we are talking about some sensitive novel cutting edge technology then we should have a different I don't know, regime of regulation or they should not be covered by the existing rules and then but then again we are now at the age of for example china has already declared its self-sufficiency in technological um in new technological era um european union is talking about open strategic autonomy which also has as, as one of these components is the so-called technological sovereignty where they want also to be in a way it's the same like self-sufficiency just in a more elaborate way and the united states has already declared that uh, their leadership position in their cutting edge technologies is a matter of national security and they're willing to to do whatever they need to do in order to secure their position as the leader in novel cutting edge technology so in fact we are already in the age where countries are just uh, trying to be as self-reliant as they can at least when it comes to this novel technologies and if you compare the list how they identify critical or novel technologies you will be surprised, but they are almost copy pasted from yeah. all of these countries. Okay, so I'll be very brief. So, um, Lothar, you said that if you invoke the exception, it frees the state from liability. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what's supposed to happen. But I think it would be interesting just to draw. I mean, everyone probably knows this already, but uh, there was a decision last year that came out called Eco Aura, where the tribunal said, the words nothing shall be construed to prevent meant well the state isn't prevented from here adopting environmental measures but that doesn't say anything about compensation the state still has to pay compensation so that's an interesting case and there are i think uh, about six or seven pending cases about general exceptions and in all those cases the investors are saying eco aura is the way to go so um we will see whether or not this is the approach that investment tribunals adopt. And the Eco Aura trib Tribunal, I don't think it ever heard of WTO law. Um, so that was an interesting one. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, uh, okay. So we have them already. How should they be interpreted? If we there's a huge corpus now of investment treaties containing this. Now, I think, and this is kind of without prejudice to my view about the scope of security, that that's the second part of your question. So I actually think that exceptions should be interpreted as permissions and not as defences. So where somebody raises a general exception or a security exception, uh, the tribunal should first determine whether or not the exception applies. So it should actually flip it on its head. It shouldn't be a defence. So I say the WCO has got it wrong. Um, they should look at the, uh, the exception first. And if it, I, and they're shaking your head. A lot of people disagree. If the state's conduct falls within the exception, it's carved out of the scope of the treaty obligations completely. So that was what I would say. Now, what is not security? I mentioned cultural identity, which is an aspect of human security. Now, when I read that, I was scratching my head. <laughs> and then yesterday, was it uh, Ricardo said corn as an issue of national security? Somebody said potatoes. Who, who, was, who was that? Who, who said potatoes? Was it a German? Indian people, for sure. <laughs> Colombians. So are they, I'm, I'm obviously a bad German because I don't think worst is an issue of national security. So I think we do draw a line somewhere. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that is. So uh, I think it's a nebulous concept and we still don't know what it should mean. <laughs> the lack of uh, consistent language mm. mm -hmm. and at the end what sometimes uh, tribunals the role of great by tribunals is that if you want to be loyal to the convention mm. and you have to be consistent you have to be language and knowledge and 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 I'm, I'm, I think about that you mentioned whether you you start with that or to end with that so if you look at whether it's an exception, a carve out, whatever you want to call it, I think you have to look at the text. And the problem that I see sometimes, some investment, some investment tribunals really don't care. Mm. <laughs> 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 They've never heard of the Vienna Convention. <laughs> well, I have a lot of anecdotes, which I cannot give 
any of them. <laughs> but what I can tell you, one of the when you start looking at the first case, the first ingredient cases, there were there were tribunals that would say, I will inter we will interpret in accordance with the Vienna Convention, they will go 31 and 32. And they will not even touch the Vienna Convention later. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. I'm not, I've seen that. Hmm. And I've seen that I've seen arbitrators saying that talking about the Vienna Convention is something very academic. But at the end, it's 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 and then for, for some of us, but uh, that that has to do with it. that poses an additional problem when dealing with that exception. Because, and I think some of the negotiators didn't even care about national security, they didn't include them. But the ones that include them, they put different texts and different ways to approach it. So at the end, and what you are not seeing is in the jurisprudence in investment, they take account of this difference in language in that built up based on the language. That's why I never believe that it's a, it's a problem to have a court on, on investments if you want to if you want to be loyal to the Vienna Convention. <laughs> and you have to invent another one. Yeah. Okay. Let's I agree with you. Let yeah. me add up because we still have a book lunch now. I invite yes. you to join us in the auditorium three. So before that, let's congratulate the panelists. <laughs>